morning, everyone. So, I, yeah. So we are going to be talking. Uh, well, well, as you know, the topic is uh, uh, schizophrenia. That's like the area that we are going to be talking about. But we are going to be looking at a very different perspective. I mean, this is not going to be a very clinical. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on just symptom symptoms and uh, the factors. But we, what we really need to know is. Uh, so, yeah, what we really need to know is the, pharma, uh, the psychopharmacology part of the kind of, the, kind of uh, the, the, the ways of treatment that are available today. And we are trying to, we are going to try and understand some of them. And we are going to try and understand why some of them could work and some of them could be risky in the long term. That is the whole idea. So, yeah, we are going to do a small clinical overview of schizophrenia, but as all of you, are uh, I mean, as all of you are studying neurosciences, it's very, very imperative for me to talk about uh, the the neurobiology behind uh, the, the the disorder, and uh, we are also going to talk about, uh, as I say, uh, the, the some of the treatment options available today. But the certain, but we also need to understand the risks that these treatment options carry with them. Okay, so the so without much further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and start. Okay, now schizophrenia is essentially a Greek word. Schizo means split. Uh, and I mean, I, I hope you're all taking down notes because I obviously am not able to see you. So I, I'm just going to hope that you're all taking down some notes. Uh, apart, do not, don't worry about copying the presentation because I'm going to send it out to you so that you all have it for you. But the kind of other, the, the other information that I'm trying to put out is better if it's noted. So schizophrenia essentially uh, is a Greek word. Schizo means split. Uh, phrenia essentially means mind. Yeah, but if you do, I mean, I advise you to not join these two terms together because it doesn't mean a split mind. It essentially means a mind that has a very contorted or rather uh, a mind that has been separated from quote unquote reality. I mean, so it affects 0.5 to 1% of the world population, which essentially is a considerable number. But what is the most important part of this disease is that it clouds the norms of perception. So for example, what are you perceiving today, students? I mean, you are all sitting in this lecture, you're all listening to me, and I'm perceiving that I'm talking to you. Okay, this is reality, correct? But, uh, but I'm able to perceive this because of the fact that there are certain neuronal circuits, there are certain circuits that are operating properly in my brain. Now, so but when these circuits of perception get disrupted is when you develop a disease of volition like schizophrenia. Now, what is important here is some, it's really, you should probably note this down. We actually have this term called aberrant salience when someone essentially is uh, sort of, uh, how do I say it, is disrupted or when someone's normal perception is disrupted, the certain uh, neuronal circuits or certain uh, brains essentially give importance to irrelevant events. And the other term that you would like to note down is pro, a prodromal symptom. A prodromal symptom is essentially when, see for example, uh, there, I mean, uh, there are many people who are under psychiatric treatment for severe schizophrenia. There are, uh, uh, how do I say it, the, there are, uh, during the early stage when the disease is not as yet completely full blown uh, you have uh, uh, you have something known as the prodromal symptom wherein you have early symptoms but these 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 uh, symptoms really uh, cannot uh, reveal anything so it can make early diagnosis difficult because say for example a symptom that can, a symptom that is maybe as simple as uh, say anxiety or depression, they also form uh, part of the prodromal symptoms, which can again easily overlap with many other psychological disorders. Okay, but before we go to schizophrenia, we I need you all to understand these two terms. The first term is etiology, and the second term is pathogenesis. So etiology essentially is an umbrella term that is used for all the factors that cause disease. So if I go back to the previous slide, the factors that contribute to schizophrenia are genetics, 
and environment as we are but uh, as we both internal and external now there are many such factors genetics and environment are not just two factors there are like as uh, there are many factors that contribute to the etiology or rather the disease are still being discovered uh, am i audible to everyone yes sir yes yes please okay, yes sir great. okay thank you so uh, am i clear so far have i been clear yes sir okay great okay so so the, so as i was saying the factors that contribute to the disease are very heterogeneous that means there are many many factors that have been discovered and to this day that are still being discovered okay so etiology is essentially an umbrella term that signifies factors that cause disease once the disease is caused the disease is going to have an effect correct everyone so for that essentially use the term pathogenesis the effect of the disease mechanisms or rather that contribute to the effect of the disease come under the term called pathogenesis the first step to any disease is etiology followed by pathogenesis and then come the symptoms okay so it is really really important for you all to understand the difference between etiology and pathogenesis so etiology comes first followed by pathogenesis etiology is cause pathogenesis is effect and then finally term is symptoms now talking about symptoms as per the diagnostic and statistical manual for psychiatry uh, which has been developed by the american psychiatric associations you have two types of symptoms students the positive symptoms and negative symptoms there is nothing positive quote and quote about positive symptoms so let's uh, let's not uh, the, the the positive symptoms are really not anything to be positive about but positive symptoms are those symptoms those psychotic symptoms that did not exist before and then uh, arose as a reason of the pathogenesis due to schizophrenia i hope everyone is understanding that so there are so under positive symptoms you have something known as delusions essentially some uh, so uh, essentially delusions would mean uh to to explain it to some extent some irrational beliefs about some people can think that they control the weather for example which is not possible at all hallucinations both auditory and visual hearing voices and seeing seeing things and disorganized speech and grossly disorganized uh, cat uh, behavior and catatonia so essentially what happens here is there is abnormality of movement that was not pr present before the onset of the disease that's the reason you call it a positive symptoms certain characteristics that have been acquired that have been added that to make an addition that's the reason they call it positive but on the other hand you have the negative symptoms so say people who are able to uh, do certain things properly because of the disease those abilities have been diminished so you have diminished expression speech emotion reaction the uh, uh, and then diminished motivation at all so for example getting out of bed or uh, like you know do going about the daily activities can be a pain so again negative symptoms it's important for you all to note it down negative symptoms also share a lot of symptomatic overlap with many other psychiatric disorders you understand right so positive symptoms so essentially what makes schizophrenia noteworthy is the development of positive symptoms okay but negative symptoms are essentially they they are able to overlap uh, with many other psychiatric disorders so that's the reason uh, and given the fact that positive symptoms have been known to be more disruptive because essentially of these two parameters that i mentioned here delusions and hallucinations so most of the treatment most of the anti psychotic drugs that have been uh, that are in uh, use today are going to be uh, are essentially targeted at treating positive symptoms and unfortunately none of the treatments or rather most of the treatments re uh, really do not uh, make really do not make any uh, uh, i mean really do not cause any betterment of the negative symptoms okay so uh, student disorganized speech and now spot something here can somebody uh, i mean i'm trying to make this interactive uh, hello can somebody answer to somebody student hello? hello yes sir yeah 
can uh, can somebody read this please i'm not going to read this but can somebody read this sentence for me please sure sir if you can make sense out of nonsense well have fun i am trying to make sense out of sense i am not making sense anymore i have to make dollars okay so the student who read thank you very much what do you think is wrong about this sentence it seems grammatically correct but does it make sense not quite why uh, it's very not just disorganized the sentence sentences don't make sense and plus they're not really connected there is no story or no information proper as such that we can get from the sentences very good but if you know, if you if uh, everyone can notice there is a phonetic connection in the sentence correct sense yes. and sense on these more on these common phonetic connections correct correct they sound the same correct s e n c e and c e n t s they both sound the same correct yes yeah so what happens here this essentially is a sentence that would be that that had been spoken out of a schizophrenia patient what happens is the the phonetic connection between sense and sense are <clears throat> essentially uh became a little more salient or became a little more prominent which essentially caused this disorganized speech so the or in other words the per person essentially confused sense and sense and then related it to dollars okay which in normal conditions would be disorganized speech i am making sense to everybody here yes yes sir okay great okay now the as we saw the so essentially a small overview of the symptoms and we essentially are going to i'm just going to go we'll go over a quick recap about uh, the neurobiology of the i mean the biology of the nervous system so essentially we all know i mean this is very very important here because we really need to understand or rather go through over some of the synaptic connections or rather the circuit connections that uh, your neural cells your nerves or your axons make with each other uh, for us to continue with this lecture that's the reason i'm not going to spend a lot of time so essentially we all know that the nervous system has one central building unit the nerve cell which essentially has the following morphology you have your dendrites that receive inputs uh, and then essentially your axon that sends out inputs and then you have an axon terminal that talks with other nerve cells okay so there are certain things that you would like to there are there are certain things that i'm going to be using in this lecture and uh, there are these are certain uh terms that i'd like you all to understand okay so here have your interneurons essentially that uh that is, uh, travel over a short distance and projection neurons that can travel from one region of the brain to the other or even one region of the body to the other or they can make the communicate they can essentially facilitate communication between cn the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system so a small uh, recap gray matter essentially if all the cell bodies came together as uh, as you can see here the entire collection would up, appear gray to you okay areas that are relatively rich in cell bodies and then you have this white matter essentially that uh, uh, that essentially if you gathered all these axons which essentially the the myelin sheath essentially has this characteristic yellowish white appearance which all is all of these were clapped together then you have something known as a white matter okay they would look yellowish white to you a ganglia or a ganglion or rather is essentially a collection of cell bodies mostly in the peripheral nervous system but there are ganglia ganglia present in the cns as well the nuclei these are certain things that i will like over okay do not confuse it with the cell nucleus is essentially a localized group of neurons organized together for particular functions okay these are certain things that you already know i know but i just wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page that i mean before we start so a very simple thing i mean neuroscience if you if you if you go about it is astoundingly simple in its basic uh, uh in its basic outlook if i were if i really wanted to make my life simple i'd just say one sentence about neuroscience nerves run on electricity and lip, the lipid bilayers are the battery so all of us we know that we we spend a lot of time with our mobile phones which need to be charged and discharged when they use right so the lipid, lipid bilayer essentially does the same thing okay so as we all know the lip in the uh, as the i mean as you all might be already aware uh we know that 
the inner side of the membrane is more a negative as compared to the outer side of the membrane okay so so essentially and this membrane potential and this difference in charge essentially contributes the membrane potential okay similar to the battery similar to the battery that you have you this membrane potential essentially is developed by a pump called the na plus k plus uh, atps pump which essentially uses uh, atp as a source of energy for it to be able to develop this potential across the lipid bilayer very very similar to your phone charger what uh, essentially you, you plug the charger to an electricity source or an energy source okay here if you if you do the analogy the energy source is atp okay so what happens here is uh, uh, this membrane potential the sodium is sent outside and potassium is sent inside both against their concentration gradients which requires atp okay this essentially quote unquote charges up the membrane okay i'm not going to spend a lot of time on how this function how this pump works but i'm just going to go through a very very uh, uh, like a rough overview okay now this the when when there is a sensory input when there is something as simple as somebody say somebody say let's say that uh, you are eating something sweet the taste receptors essentially in your tongue send a graded potential uh, which essentially gets converted to an action potential upon reaching a certain threshold an action potential is essentially the conducting electricity of your neuro ner i mean your nervous system because uh, we are, i'm not going to go into the uh, again i'm not going to go into the details of action potential because there are quite a lot of things that i'd like to cover but what i like to what you what i like you all to understand is that then action potential is an all or none event that happens because of changes in the membrane potential the first change is a depolarization which is caused because of the entry of sodium ions into the cell making the inside of the membrane more positive as you know as you are all aware the inside of the membrane is negative with respect to the outside so when positive ions like sodium enter it it uh, essentially makes it less negative this is called a depolarization so the cycle of depolarization and repolarization events is essentially across your axon membrane as i can see here when an action potential travels across the axon essentially is is essentially how your sensory inputs or your motor outputs both travel this is essentially how your nervous system function this is the basic now but we all know for electrical circuits i mean we we need to we are, there are many uh, there are many connections there are many connection junctions and there are many logical junctions for uh, uh, for this for it to circuit uh, for for the circuit to function optimally correct so what happens here you have if you use the same analogy you have uh, the same synapse you have the same connections here in neuronal parlance they are called as synapses synapses essentially are gaps between an axon terminal of one okay and the dendritic terminal of other okay so there are excitatory synapses and inhibitory synapses both are equally necessary for the neuro the the the, the, the system to function optimally okay so what happens here excitatory synapse this is a pre synaptic cell that means the cell from that ha that has an action potential coming all the way through it is going to release a neurotrans neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft which essentially is going to be received by the post synaptic cell so if the post synaptic cell has a depolarization it will fire up as an action potential that is an excitatory synapse if on the other hand if you have a neurotransmitter that causes the post cell to be more negative there won't be there will not be any action potential fired in the post synaptic cell so that is because the inside of the membrane becomes more negative 
So essentially, when when there are chloride channels, or there are other negative, ions, when there are chloride channels, for example, that are essentially or that that, that open up and ca causing an influx of Cl minus into the cell, you would have an uh, you would have a hyperpolarization. That means the cell membrane is becomes more. I mean, sorry, the inner. Uh, I mean, the inside of the cell becomes more negative as opposed to the outside. This would not result in an action potential. I hope this much is clear so far. Is everyone? I mean, so we are all aware of the difference between an excitatory and collapse. Okay. Now, the uh, this is again uh, you do not have to worry about it. But there are two neurotransmitters that we are going to be concerned in the context of schizophrenia, which is and uh, uh, and the other one here is again GABA. Both of these things, as we would pass further, as we would go further with this presentation, we'll be concerned with these two neurotransmitters. Okay, neuro dopamine is generally excitatory. Okay, or it can also be inhibitory at some sites. Okay. Now, what happens here? But it is now that we have understood the basic mechanism, the basic blueprint of. The nervous system. It is understand. It is important for us to understand that the synapses that are made, the connections, the neuronal circuit connections that are made in our brain are continuously variable. I mean, as and when you do, as and when you do, learn new things, as and when you you encounter new experiences, all there is a change. There is an addition. There is. Uh, uh, some kind of dynamism that works in the new nervous system for us to be able to uh, understand and perceive all these experiences. So our neuro, uh, so there is a contiguous variation. So for example, the way all of our perceptions, if you look at it individually, they are all very unique. So that is the reason each neuronal circuit. I mean, we we all there are there are certain things that we perceive commonly. But how we relate those perceptions with each other is completely unique to one person. So what I'm trying to say is, as a population, we are incredibly neurodiverse, and the synaptic connections. When as when when I learned neurosciences, someone told me that okay, your synapses are formed. Your after you like you know after you after a certain age, uh, uh, there are no neuronal synapses or there are no uh, new neurons that are being generated. But now that has been proved completely false. Neurons are not at all static, and neuronal remodeling, as well as synaptic remodeling, and adult neurogenesis, they have all been proven to exist even as an adult. Till I mean, the rate might not be as prolific as uh, during your childhood, but as an adult, you still have uh, potential for neurogenesis. This is something that is very, very, very important. For, uh, and it's actually a very it presents a very positive outlook as far as uh, uh, treatment towards many uh, neurodegenerative conditions as well as psychiatric conditions are concerned. Are you all with me? Uh, can can I have an answer, please? Are you all with me? Just give yes, a sir. thumbs up at least. Okay, yeah. great. I are you all able to follow me so far, please? Yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Okay. So. The logic, as I was saying, we 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 simply have to marvel at the logical circuitry because it is the kind of million connections that uh, the I mean, like you know, the million is probably still an understatement. We have been able to make so many. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how do I say it? Uh, it is. Uh, I mean, it is essentially a computer magnified maybe a trillion times. A computer can like multitask, but but the human brain is much much more powerful than a computer. So uh, so yes, so no amount of artificial intelligence can, for that matter, replicate the human intelligence. Okay, so this is essentially something that I want you all to pontificate upon because uh, we we tend to underestimate the power of our own. Uh, nervous system or the neuronal uh, like the the neuronal makeup which essentially has been the case so far but and i'll i'll probably prove some of that uh, in the slides okay so as i was saying do not worry about the complex diagram okay uh, the, the only thing that i wanted you all to take over is that 
like the, 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 the your synapses, the formation, how a connection is formed between a presynaptic axon terminal and a postsynaptic uh, 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 cell essentially is uh, dependent upon a lot of uh, factors. More. The first, the major factor essentially is the stimuli. Okay, so uh, as you say, like, you know, for example, if you, um, let's say that there are certain things that are ingrained in your memory, you really do not have to, uh, you really do not have to think a lot. So uh, you can retrieve certain information uh, like immediately. So that is because of the fact that there has been some kind of a long term potentiation that has happened. That means uh, there is, there has been continuous stimulus in that particular region, which has essentially clubbed together to form a strong synapse. Okay, so as far as the other factors that contribute to the formation of synapses uh, are concerned, uh, you have the you you have a lot of genes that involve that are involved, and you have like a lot of uh, cytoskeletal rearrangement mechanisms that essentially facilitate to stick these two cells together, you know, so that the synapse is strong. Okay, so. Uh, so, I mean, do not worry about the molecular mechanisms because they are, they, are, they are beyond the scope, but I just wanted you to appreciate by you looking at the schematic diagram that there are a lot of factors that fact, uh, you know, play in making sure that uh, there is uh, a strong synaptic connection. But there are certain things that I would nonetheless like you to remember here. If you can pay attention here, there are, I mean, uh, there are two uh, proteins that have been labeled neurexin and neuroligin. Okay, so these essentially are involved in cell adhesion uh, between the two synapses, and we know that mutations that cause some co some kind of uh, 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 dysfunction between neuro I mean in uh, within neu neurexin and neuroligin have been both implicated in schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorders. So somebody who probably might be, uh, might have a, gen uh, like a genetic polymorphism, uh, the, as far as this genetic loci are concerned, they might be, might be more susceptible to developing schizophrenia. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it is very, very important for us to remember that it is the causes of all the psychiatric disorders cannot be attributed to one factor. What I really need you all to appreciate is that what causes these disorders are very, very, very diverse and are extremely hit. Okay, so it is, it, is for, it is important for us to appreciate the diversity that cause what is normal and what is abnormal. Now, what is, but now, but what, as far as today's class is concerned, I'm just going to focus on one particular uh, aspect of schizophrenia that is part of the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. What happens here? We know, I mean, there is increasing evidence and, uh, and uh, people are, uh, and it is, then there is rather strong evidence that says that increased, I mean, there is an increase in the production of dopamine as far as the pathogenesis of schizophrenia is concerned. So, a typical dopaminogenic, a dopaminergic synapse essentially works. Uh, uh, I mean, essentially works on the following uh, uh, logical. Uh, uh, I mean, essentially works on the following steps. Uh, it uh, you have the amino acid tyrosine, which essentially gets converted into dihydroxyphenylalanine, which is called dopa, from which comes dopamine. This biochemical pathway is very, very important. And there are enzymes that act to facilitate this biochemical pathway in a presynaptic uh, cell, which essentially upon uh, the arrival of an action, pot uh, I mean, action potential, uh, it releases uh, the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, which is going to be received by the postsynaptic cell. So this is very, very important. So when there is an increased dopamine production, there are many uh, psychotic symptoms that have been associated with the increased dopamine production. Okay, so for us, for us to maintain homeostasis, it is very, very important to increase the production of uh, dopamine when required and also stop the or degrade uh, the production of dopamine so that the synapse really does not fire when it's not required to fire. 
So that is very, very important. So the enzymes that break down dopamine so uh, and degrade dopamine so that uh, once the function is over, our call, I mean, one of the group of the enzymes that does so is uh, the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Okay, do not worry about the biochemical pathway. Okay, but what I read, what you, but monoamine oxidase inhibitors is something that I would like you all to remember today because that is one of the enzymes that I'm going to be talking about, which is involved in the breakdown of dopamine once the function of dopamine has been served. Okay. So once the uh, once the uh, how do I say it once the uh, uh, it is important to remove the dopamine from the synaptic cleft once it has acted upon the postsynaptic cell. Okay. Now most uh, drugs or antipsychotic drugs essentially sit on the let me just go ahead the dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic as well as the presynaptic cell. So there are, uh, so essentially we are, uh, the, 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 the drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia essentially are the ones that target the dopamine pathway. Okay. So what I really want you, this is not going to be a neuroanatomy lecture, but what I really, really want you all to understand uh, is the fact that there is a neuronal pathway that is very, very important in the development of psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia, which I would like you all to focus upon. Okay, so as you can see here in the slide, you have the coronal section, essentially, uh, if, the, if uh, the brain were to face you, uh, and, uh, it has be, uh, and it has been, uh, uh, so that would be the coronal section, but if the brain, essentially, if you look at the sideways, and the brain has been cut along the cerebral hemispheres, you'd have the sagittal section. Okay, so the, there are two, the, uh, the, what is really, really important is in the pathogenesis of schizophrenia is the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, amygdala, hippocampus. This essentially, these are the four terms that I would like you all to remember. Okay, but what happens here is uh, essentially uh, the, if you look at it, let me just go ahead. Yeah, okay. This particular pathway here, starting from the prefrontal cortex, going all the way to the midbrain and coming to the dorsal striatum. This this line or the circuit here is the most important in as of today as of today's knowledge is concerned is the most important in the development of the uh, i mean in the pathogenesis or the psychotic symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia okay are all of you with me yes sir yeah so please yes, this the inputs uh, uh, from the prefrontal cortex the amygdala the midbrain and the dorsal striatum. These are the areas that I require you all to remember. And these are the areas that are rich in dopaminergic nerves. Okay, so the what happens here, most of the antipsychotic drugs today essentially function on this particular pathway. So what happens here is the when there is increased, when there is an increase in the dopamine uh, secretion along the D2 pathway that inputs, that essentially projects onto the thalamus is when the positive symptoms, positive symptoms, I remind you all, essentially the ones that are in, that, that I was talking about that, for example, uh, your, I mean, people who suffer from, uh, unfortunately suffer from delusions or hallucinations, both auditory and visual, all of these things essentially are, there is strong evidence that the, the increased the, uh, dopamine secretion from the striatum uh, along the D2 pathway causes the uh, positive symptoms. And most antipsychotic drugs attenuate or reduce the uh, positive symptoms uh, by attenuating the D2 pathway. What do I mean by D1 and D2? Essentially, dopamine has five different types of receptors. So the D2 receptor, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. These are the receptors that dopamine acts on when it binds to the postsynaptic cell membrane. Okay. So, I mean, these are the receptors through which the, uh, the transmitters bind. Okay. So the D2 receptors is 
the D2 receptor is inhibitory and let me just go ahead yes and essentially uh, this uh, per particular group is one minute just a second please please bear with me yeah this is the side so when there is an increased D2, when there is an increased striatum, uh, uh, pardon, when there is an increased dopamine secretion in the D2 pathway is, uh, is when the psychotic symptoms are thought to develop. Okay, so. But the problem is, given the fact that most of the dopamine, this is where I wanted to talk about how uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, how do I say it? The antipsychotic drugs that are essentially targeting the D2 pathway, D2 receptor pathway, essentially uh, are uh, are a cause of uh, concern for me because uh, dopamine synapses are not same everywhere. Okay, so as I was talking about this neuronal circuit, the entire route that this particular uh, area that we are talking about is rich in dopaminergic neurons and a drug that targets the dopamine, the D2 receptor is going to act unilaterally all across this route. Okay, but the problem is that the, the dopamine synapses are not similar or not same all along the route. That's the reason I wanted to come across why the heterogeneity are, uh, the heterogeneity of the dopamine synapses are a major concern. Okay, so we, as I was talking about the neural circuit, you have the cortex, the midbrain, and the striatum. These three areas are very, very, very crucial in development of the psychotic symptoms. So uh, there is a model that has been, uh, uh, how do I, there has been a model that has been discovered very, very recently, as recent as 2017, that talks about how certain antipsychotic drugs really do not take into account about really take into account the heterogeneity of the uh, dopamine synapses. So, the, so what has been shown here is there is, you need dopamine, you need an increased, a good inhibitory dopamine secretions in the cortex. Okay, so dopamine, as we all know, is inhibitory. So when there is an inhibitory secretion, I want somebody to answer, please. When there is an inhibitory secretion, what will happen to this particular neuron here, class? Will it fire or not? Not fire. It will not fire. It will not fire, correct? So that means uh, where from one to two, there won't be any, I mean, there, there'll be reduced input on uh, uh, at synapse number two here. Can you all see it? Yes? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, so yeah. Okay. And on the other hand, if you, oh, there is a uh, there is a similar uh, 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 the now here and this is a projection neuron that has reached from the cortex to the midbrain. Okay. Now what happens here uh, with this, this increased dopamine secretion plus an increased inhibitory GABA interneuron here? Uh, both of them keep both of them work together to keep to shut this particular uh, connection between the midbrain and the striatum. That means there is this, when, when GABA is going to be secreted here, this neuron is going to be inhibited and it won't fire. That means you will have less DA secretion in the striatum. Please remember class, it's very, very important. We all, we all know that the positive symptoms of schizophrenia have been thought to arise from increased striatal the, uh, the uh, dopamine secretion, correct? Yes, I want a response, please. Hello? Can someone hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, uh, do you all understand that we need an increased, I mean, sorry, uh, the, I mean, the, uh, uh, the psychot, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia are caused due to the increased dopamine secretion in the striatum. So, for for to minimize the positive symptoms, you really need to keep this particular number five down. Okay, but what can I want somebody to appreciate this, or rather, I want somebody to answer. So, 
why, why does the heterogeneity of the dopamine synapse very very important in taking i mean why why is it very important in taking uh, uh, why is it so important that it has to be taken into consideration why do we have to pay very stringent attention to the heterogeneity can somebody answer this so let's say that i'm using a drug that is going to enter the brain and that's going to sit on all the dopamine uh, uh, i mean that's going to disrupt the entire dopamine unilaterally what do you think will be the risk here can someone answer please so the other pathways will be hampered the other pathways will be hampered yeah true why because you uh, uh, you i mean if if somebody told me that dopamine is uh, you you have dopamine i mean somebody told me that uh, yeah okay the, we have increased dopamine in schizophrenia let's just use some drug to block that pathway but what happens is the increase is not uniform all over you there are pathways that where, wherein you actually need an increased dopamine secretion am i making myself clear okay you need good dopamine in cortex for you to have less dopamine in the striatum are you all understanding this yes sir okay great now what happens in uh, a, a disrupted dopamine model is can be seen in this uh, representative diagram here so what happens is when there is less dopamine secretion in the cortex this inhibition on the glutamatergic neuron is lifted that means the neuron is free to fire can you all appreciate this uh, when there is low dopamine here this is going to fire that means when the that means this neuron is now going to secrete more da into the striatum okay what is now so that's the reason why it is very very important to no, uh, to not have a very unilateral view of um, uh, uh, neurotransmitters and not attribute to the development of an entire disorder to one molecule because to put it in the simplest possible way our brain everything is interconnected so a uh, disruption at one area is going to cause a systemic effect on the entire system that is uh, uh, i mean on the entire neuronal makeup that is something that we all need to understand so a disrupted uh, dopamine secretion at the cortex can cause an increased d2 secre i uh, can cause an increased uh, dopamine secretion at the striatum that is something that i would like to have that i'd like to state as the take home message of this particular neurobiology of schizophrenia now the dopamine model as you can see here you know what causes as we are talking about the etiology okay now if you look at this particular uh, flow chart that i that i that i've shared uh, can somebody identify what is uh, the i mean what are the etiological factors and what are the pathogenetic factors if you have understood difference between the etiology and pathogenesis i want somebody from the class to identify what are the path etiological factors that are present in this flow chart and what are the pathogenetic factors in this flow chart can somebody volunteer please hello mm -hmm. so uh, what i think is the genetic factors and the impaired gluta uh glutamatergic uh, regulation are and then increased striatal da release are your um etiological factors while aberrant silence your psychotic symptoms and then the acute psycho social stress that leads to your um those the other one or uh, your pathogenesis uh okay thanks for the uh, you are correct partially correct there but i would probably if i were you i'd probably say genetic risk factors and acute psychosocial stress are the two etiological factors which okay. essentially cause uh, the effect of blunted cortical da release impaired glutamatergic uh, regulation and increased striatal d one oh. these three are the pathogenesis okay. okay and aberrant salience and psychotic symptoms come the symptoms okay the third okay okay Yeah. Thanks for thanks yeah. for the uh, thanks for the information. Thanks for the try. It's a very good try. So, uh, as you correctly mentioned, genetic risk factors as well as acute psychosocial stress are the etiological factors. Okay. So, 
if you look at this, you know, uh, uh, acute psychosocial stress, it is very, very important for us to uh, keep our stress levels down because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, chronic stress in vulnerable individuals can be a contributing factor. Please, I'm saying not a causative factor, can be a contributing factor for many of the prodromal symptoms of many psychological this, uh, I mean, psychological disorders, okay, or rather many neurodegenerative diseases as well. So the end point is the take home message is we all need to relax in our lives a little more. Okay. Okay. Now let's go ahead. Now, this is something that I would like to talk about dopamine super sensitivity or hypersensitivity. Okay. What happens here? I'm just going to go to the, yeah. So let's say that I have a psychi anti psychotic drug that is going to block the D2 receptors, okay? Uh, which essentially uh, is going to happen when somebody is going to <clears throat> go for psychiatric treatment for uh, their uh, uh, disease. In this case, schizophrenia. What happens here is the, the so now we know that there is something called dopamine hypersensitivity or supersensitivity that's going to happen. Now, when there is going to be a D2 receptor that is going to be blocked by a drug, the system is going to respond to it by synthesizing more D2 receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. A uh, postsynaptic membrane. Can somebody tell me what could happen? due to a long-term use of a drug that blocks D2 receptors. I want somebody to volunteer again, please. I'm going to tell you uh, what the information that I've given you is that there is a drug that's going to sit on the D2 receptor and block its function, but the system is going to respond by synthesizing more D2 receptors to the uh, to this particular uh, happening. What is going to happen when such things, when, when drugs, when there is a long-term use of antipsychotic drugs? What's a major risk? Can somebody tell me? Please. Volunteer, please. Somebody. Hello? Yes, students. Anyone volunteering? Did I... Uh, like like will it be will it be similar to the uh, similar to like uh, like uh, a more amount of dopamine will be required for the next time for having a uh, optimum threshold to trigger or something sort of that because it is similar to like uh, when we uh, correlate with the caffeine so if we use a lot of yeah. caffeine we uh, a lot of caffeine receptors uh, means a lot of caffeine receptors are being formed but after a particular time our body get used to that particular uh, amount of caffeine so we need uh, more, more caffeine to, more caffeine to uh, like uh, react or something is it uh, related to that as well very very good in fact you are on the right track so what's going to be excellent thank you very much for that uh, contribution so what happens here when there is a d2 receptor that has been blocked when there is, let's say that a, a postsynaptic cell membrane has one D2 receptor and I blocked it with a drug. The, and uh, uh, so, and the body is going to respond. The system is going to respond by synthesizing another D2 receptor. So that means uh, A, for, for, for somebody to keep the psychotic symptoms down, the dosage of the drug increases with time. And we, no, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, we really do not have to be even experts in neurosciences to understand that these drugs have extremely bad side effects and undesirable side effects. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, long-term usage of such uh, antipsychotic drugs, if you factor in this phenomenon of dopamine supersensitivity, which means the D2 receptors are going to be are going to become. We are not talking about. Uh, Caffeine here, uh, I mean, we are talk, going to talk about uh, receptors of dopamine. That means there are going to be so many receptors that are going to be synthesized in response to the drug treatment that your postsynaptic membrane is going to become incredibly hypersensitive to dopamine. That means you really have to keep the drug dose up for the positive symptoms to stay down. 
this is one of the major reasons why people when they go on uh, schizophrenia drug treatments they essentially are on lifelong uh, dr drug treatment which is essentially sad because that's a huge payoff considering the side effects these drugs have and given the fact that we also figured out that dopamine synapses are not same everywhere within the brain so you understand the major risks of a uh, psychiatric drug that are being prescribed but these the i mean there are many things that really uh, i mean uh, are it is very saddening about the current uh, state scenario because uh, uh, i i personally this is my opinion uh, i personally feel that the uh, when there is uh, the, the 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 kind of trade off that happens in psychiatric treatment essentially does more harm than any good is what i personally feel but there are people who can differ but because uh, but it is very very important for us to consider these nuances with, before one goes into a drug prescription uh, and i mean there are certain psychiatric disorders that would require medication i'm not against medication but we all need to understand that the the it is going to be the effect of uh, uh, it, the, the, the 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 prescription or rather the treatment course should be decided based on nuances rather than to, uh, rather than very unilateral observations okay we need uh, we need to reduce dopamine secretion in the brain so let's just prescribe a drug no it's not that simple instead of simplistic approaches you need nuanced based approaches when the when when one when is given or when is one one when one is handed out a prescription for a anti psychotic drug so that is one thing that i would really like to stress and uh, it would be important for you uh, uh, students to understand the importance of dopamine super sensitivity okay uh, and uh, which is uh, something that uh, and uh, it would be important for you to understand uh, the importance of dopamine super sensitivity in the context of the positive symptoms and psychiatric treat uh, i mean the psychotic anti psychotic drugs that are being prescribed for the treatment of schizophrenia okay now just a second there is something else that i would like to address one minute this is something that we saw earlier anand sir i think we have another 5 okay. minutes yeah so that's the only thing because then the lecture time ends yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it will only take 5 minutes okay yeah 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 so the thing is we were talking about the uh, we were talking about the importance of the synthesis of dopamine in a presynaptic cell and the breakdown the metabolic breakdown of dopamine once the function of dopamine as a neurotransmitter has its uh, has been served the enzymes that essentially cause uh, i mean the breakdown of dopamine are are the group one group of enzymes that essentially causes the breakdown of dopamine are monoamine oxidase sorry so what happens with monoamine oxidase uh, enzymes is that uh, they essentially catalyze the breakdown of dopamine at the synaptic cleft okay but now i want i want you all to understand and reflect upon the use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors as antidepressants that means if i have a drug that is going to inhibit this enzyme there is going to be more dopamine that is going to remain at the synaptic cleft okay what risk does that carry this is the last question for the lecture that's it and after that we end for the day but can somebody volunteer how i mean let me rephrase my question how an increased use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors which were like the first antidepressants that came into the market could actually contribute to schizophrenia can somebody tell me why i told you monoamine oxidase is are involved in the breakdown of dopamine and if i'm going to inhibit this particular enzyme there is not going to be as much breakdown of dopamine and dopamine is going to accumulate now can somebody tell me how could this contribute to schizophrenia i think i have answered most of the question but like you know can somebody volunteer on the list please yeah so so just like you said that uh once dopamine increases you have more symptoms like your it affects your sa in the brain and because of which you might get schizophrenia 
right exactly exactly and uh, but what is important is where is the increased dopamine uh, uh, secretion uh, 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 where is it uh, uh, like where does it rise concern you know where does it cause concern in the striatum it is very very important okay it is very very important to also mention the locus in which the increased dopamine secretion happens okay because we i mean there are places where we actually need a good dopamine secretion correct so these monoamine oxidase inhibitors can actually there the been uh, uh, you know there have been clinical studies where there have been uh, uh, antipsychotic drug induced schizophrenia that have been caused so the end point is i mean the take home message is that we really have to be concerned about the over dependence on antipsychotic drugs that's what i meant to type which leads to gradual increase in dosage and in, uh, like once these drugs come into the market or like you know before these drugs come into the market the clinical trials are not properly monitored so many of these drugs uh, the side effects are not even documented so the, there are certain concerns that we really need to address and uh, that is uh, something that uh, we would all like to think about and the most important part that i would like to talk about is mental illness should not be stigmatized because as we know that the complexity so what uh, in the neuronal level the difference between at the neuronal level the difference between what is normal and what is abnormal is not very black and white at all as i was saying the line between normality and disorder is very very blurred okay so it is very very what is uh, i mean many of the people who have mental health issues unfortunately suffer from stigma but if you look at the neurobiology i mean they they really do not uh, i mean uh, there is not uh, like i mean there is a difference yes that's the reason there is a disorder is being caused but it is very uh, i mean but it should not be a reason for stigma these are the things that i would like to talk about or that i wanted to talk about and i hope uh, uh you all uh, were able to understand me okay because i hope i was able to convey clearly what i wish to convey through this lecture thank you very much again uh, for this great opportunity thank you definitely it was a very great lecture i think and at least revising the basics brought in an approach to understand this concept much deeper and many of them have given their cis so they have understood a lot of things and learned their basics i think uh, i would like bivas and rayan to just address their questions first to uh, sir okay yeah bivas go ahead first because uh, you got two more sir yeah. so my first question is uh, when we are talking about this dopaminergic thing Uh, mm-hmm. i have read that like uh, there are cases of synaptic synaptic pruning which is leading to the neurodegenerative diseases so okay. in case of synaptic pruning the regular therapeutic drug is not going to work so what type of therapeutics could be used over there because only the underlying cause cannot be like the genetic or something sort of that so it can be a, a synaptic pruning case as well so what type of therapeutics are being used in this like recent uh, times if the schizophrenia is caused by the synaptic pruning see synaptic pruning essentially i would say that it's a very generic term okay i mean uh, it's a very very generic term that uh, well, it is a causative factor i'm not saying i'm not i'm not denying that but again it is it is really really important for us to understand uh, what are the what are the characteristics of that particular synapse that is being involved there i mean it is uh, i can only say because uh, uh i mean uh, synaptic pruning i mean uh, uh, from the term it can uh, how do i say it can be caused by various many uh, uh, i mean it 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 can be uh, uh, how do i say it it can be a very uh, uh, it, it could be a very heterogeneous factor wherein there are many things that play there so it uh, we cannot this attribute to uh, i mean it is very important for us to study that particular context to for uh, for somebody to uh, uh, say uh, 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 maybe like design a drug that could understand uh, that could address that particular issue i i'm not sure if i answered your question correctly because i really do not because synaptic pruning is a very generic term and uh, and uh, it is important for us to understand the, uh, the that particular molecular context or the cellular context in which it's occurring Uh, unless until uh, we know that which is which is essentially the, the, uh, the that the 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 mechanics of that entire uh, cellular environment has properly characterized for anybody 
to for uh, for uh, for any kind of drug design to happen it's a good question uh, which essentially again asserts the importance of how uh, 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 very i mean nuance based research is necessary for any kind of uh, treatment that is important next question please thank uh, you rian you can please ask your question yes sir my question was uh, since one of the causes of uh, schizophrenia is environmental factors yes if if one were to expose a healthy individual who has no genetic predisposition to develop schizophrenic uh, symptoms and if you expose them to visual and auditory simulations such as virtual reality simulations of uh, you know hallucinations and audio simulations such as you know sounds that a schizophrenic person would hear and if you gradually increase the intensities of the simulations for maybe the duration of 6 months or something could mm-hmm. that healthy individual develop if not schizophrenic schizophrenic form symptoms over time once the simulations have stopped see the thing is one system okay uh uh well okay well let's say okay good a very good question actually so let's uh, let's address the first part of the question you have an if you have a healthy individual who is not genetically susceptible at all and then has been uh, uh, exposed to say uh, some of these psychosocial stimuli like virtual reality or something like that okay or or or, uh, or life uh, uh, i mean or to or to even simplify things further chronic stress for that matter you know so you you make the person more vulnerable to a prodromal state i mean that's the early state of schizophrenia but uh, the chances that the person will develop full blown schizophrenia with uh, manifestation with clear clinical manifestations of both positive and negative symptoms are less if you compare it to a genetically vulnerable person but the second part of the question is when you stop the you said that you stop these uh, you you uh, essentially alter the environment uh, maybe you these uh, these stimulation these stimuli have uh, when wherein you talk about stopping these stimuli the uh, given that there is ample scope of adult neurogenesis you essentially have i mean uh, the there is there's a very very high chance that the brain will come back to normal yeah that is a positive uh outlook i would say that we can develop when when the, when the person is in a better environment uh it is a there is a very high chance that the brain can heal itself uh by developing better and more healthier uh, uh, synapses and uh by uh by maybe uh, uh by increasing neurogenesis of the affected pathways uh, there is a very high chance that the brain comes back to normal and having said that that's the reason why it is very uh, important for even people who are vulnerable to schizophrenia or other psychiatric disorders to keep the environment positive and to keep to keep the environment healthy for you know, to allow them this so called genetic vulnerability uh, to uh, allow them to heal that is that would be my answer to your question thanks for that question thank you sir Okay. In context to that, there was one last question I will take. That was Devas's question in context mm-hmm. to yes. Rian's question. Only just take that last. And if anyone has any other questions, I'll give you all sir's email ID. You can always drop sir an email, and I think that would be good, Anand. Yeah, because... definitely. I'll be more than happy. Yeah, great. So Devas, last question. Yes. So Devas over here. Uh, my question was in relation to Rehan's question that he asked. my question was can we use regarding virtual... what was that sorry i don't i'm not very regarding good. the previous question that you answered i have okay. a follow up question sure. so it was like can we use virtual reality as a therapy for psychosis like virtual reality which can allow the patients to talk to an avatar of their hallucinations explore location that they give them anxiety and practice talking to others in variety of threatening or non threatening situation gives patients a chance to work through their fears in a non risk environment is it possible like to use this virtual simulation as a therapy for the uh, like just like you at, at the end you mentioned that uh, being in a good environment is going to uh, like create a better like um, synapses in a um, in a positive way so is it possible using virtual reality e virtual reality okay but it is very very important because 
uh, what a okay a, a very good question and i'd like to use this question to answer, uh, to to introduce not i mean it's not going to be a long answer but it is very very important to also appreciate that no two schizophrenia patients are same so as i was saying uh, we, are, uh, we at the outset that we are all like you know we all have common uh, stimuli auditory visual uh, and olfactory but all of us perceive these stimuli make connection in our own way correct so you and me both perceive red color okay but i might not like red and you might like red why because it is the connection that i have formed for myself what happens here is again the for example there is something called as paranoid schizophrenia wherein the delusion or the hallucinations are very scary for the person or and there can be a, a schizophrenia patient wherein the positive symptoms are not associated with fear per se but nonetheless are dangerous because he like you know there is an of reality so we cannot it is very very it is very very patient dependent so if you look at bio bio statistics i'd say that for all the for all the treatments that uh, for schizophrenia n should always be considered as one n should be one for because no two schizophrenia patients are similar and the you do not i mean the genetic and the environmental causes that would have contributed to disease of two different schizophrenia patients would have been completely different so uh, uh, maybe for that particular person let's say that you talked about a person who probably talked about a patient who probably had fear then there could be uh, uh, there, then one could consider treatments like virtual reality which could sort of uh, like to help in attenuating or reducing that fear but we cannot generalize a treatment that would be my answer to your question the the point okay, is sir. thank you understood the, the point is that two no two uh, schizophrenia patients are same you know it is like it's not having uh, uh, it's not similar to having maybe a stomach infection wherein like people can respond equally to an antibiotic you know it is very very it is uh, uh, things are very gray as far as uh, the psychiatric treatments are concerned that is my general answer and it is something that we all should remember Uh, when we are talking about treatment center because no two patients are ever the same in psychiatry yeah okay so i think with that we shall end today's session and i would like riyan to just uh, thanks sir on behalf of all the students yes riyan yes sir so on behalf of all the students i would just like to say thank you for taking time out of your schedule to you know give us this guest lecture and it was seriously really really informative because we just gave us exams and we studied about Uh, schizophrenia as a disorder, and it's really, really interesting to you know learn a little bit more about it and delve into the subject even further. And I'm really, really sure that all of us have taken something from this, and we can you know dig further into the topic if it interests us. So thank you so much. You're welcome, and well, I hope I did a decent job because uh, for me this is the. Uh, I mean, I'm not very used to. Uh, I mean, I, I'm more of an interactive person in a classroom, so nothing beats classroom teaching. So for me, the I mean, uh, uh, I really do miss the classroom teaching part. But I hope I was able to do a decent job, nonetheless, in making you all understand some parts, some aspects of things that I would like to that I would have liked to get across. Anyways, great, great, great having you, Anand. Dear, thanks so much, and um, definitely I will pass on this PowerPoint to all the students and um, give them your email ID so they can contact you with respect to their doubts. Thank you, students, for participating, and I hope you all have learned a little more than what I had put to you all in schizophrenia. So, thank you, Anand, once again, and thanks a lot, uh, Kyle, for this wonderful.